Hello. I would like to welcome everyone to the 53rd episode of Money Trees. Web3 is creating a space for artists to bring their wildest dreams to life. Now that may sound hyperbolic to some, but think about this. When you look at the landscape of creatives that feel motivated in a way they never have before, that have opportunities to support themselves in ways they never have before, ways to cement their art in ways they never have before, it becomes hard to deny. Today we speak with Black Orchid, an artist, producer, songwriter, curator, all around incredible person that is using NFTs to find her community and give life to her sonic opuses. How are you feeling today? I feel amazing. Um, I feel I feel blessed to be here to speak with you and talk about my journey. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for coming on. You know, let me start off by showing you some love. Saw that you were one of April's uh, April's Crypto Hair Magazine cover queens. That was pretty ill. Thank you. So how? Thank you very much. How did that come about? Um, I saw the previous cover and I was like fangirling because I used to be a fan of you know hair magazines growing up. And I I said, yeah, Charm, I I want to be on your cover one day. You know, Zara Charm. So um, yeah, she. She reached out to me and she's like, yeah, what about next month? And I said, yeah. So, and that's how it came about really. And then it's just been an honor really to be on the cover like that. It's just a, a dream come true for me, you know? Yeah, no, I saw it. The, the, other, uh, the other, I don't know why my teas are killing me today. Excuse me. The other cover queens all looked amazing. You know, it's ill because to me, when I got to prepare for our episode, there was so much that I became aware of that you were involved in. And it really just got me thinking, like, how did you get started in Web3? Well, um, I got started last year, November. Um, Tika, um, she's an amazing person and a friend of mine in real life. Um, she she actually onboarded me to the space in November. And I was like, you know, what do I do? person i'm like what the hell is this what the hell is an nft what is a blockchain what's what's ETH? you know what i'm saying so um she connected me to visionaire which is an amazing person in this space um who you know selflessly give gave, gave his time to you know onboard me first in this space. and then i just started looking around on twitter you know popping in space and just really listening and stuff so I was here when Latasha, you know, dropped her music video that sold 50K. I was I was here for that. Um, I I was here for a lot of things. I was here for Tika's Genesis. Um, back it, it just it, it's weird because this shit seems like it's so long ago, but it's not. It's like only been like five six months or six. Oh my God, it's crazy. Um, so um, after I saw what Latasha did and she was offering um, classes on Zorotopia, so I was like, yeah, I need to go learn what the hell is going on you know, with all this shit. So I sit in her Zoom class and, you know, I'm bewildered, but I'm learning all this stuff you know, about about Web3 and NFTs and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, cool. Okay. So uh, the new year comes around, January rolls around, and um, um, I hear that that people want to collab with, with Alan Kingdom. So, yeah, we're going to collab. Can you send me some, some beats? So I send her a couple of beats, and um, the one that she chose is like, oh my gosh, like we need to, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna send it to Alan, we're gonna write this. So uh, it wasn't even maybe a day or two. Uh, she came back with a with a rough draft of the record, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys killed this beat. Let's say it's crazy. They went off and finished it, mixed and mastered it. But um, bam, they you know got the artwork together. And the following week, they, they put it up for auction, you know, on catalog. It's my first my first placement in the space, you know what I'm saying? And it's not really kidding me that, you know, this is my very first placement uh, in this space as a producer. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the NFT drops on catalog, a bidding war occurs. Um, and, like, the, you know, sorry, the, 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 the record was placed, I think, at 3 ETH uh, reserve. That was met, and then maybe a couple of days later, a bidding war occurred, and it sold for 4.48. So I was, I was mind blown at this point, and I was shocked, you know, because um, I never seen that kind of um, success with my music three, you know. So um, I was shocked, you know, had that kind of success on entering 
space like that. So, um, then, you know, everybody's doing amazing projects. I was here when, when, when Alan dropped a buy away. I was here, you know, when, when Black Dave was just starting out and he was trying to get people to buy his NFTs and what he's doing now, it's so fucking incredible. And um, then I was like, you know, uh, I want to, you know, start putting out my own stuff. But I was really sure to go about doing it. I stopped because I feel like. <laughs> Hello? Hey, yeah, so I didn't, I, I couldn't tell. I'm getting, I might be getting rugged. I got to check on the other account. Because um, I was hearing like every other word. And so I got the gist of it. Uh, I don't oh, know okay. I'm like sorry. Me or not. Um, I feel like I'm rambling, but maybe I should. Uh, no, no, no. You're gonna, you, I can hear you. I can hear you clearly now. I don't know what was happening before. Oh, I was um, going off and not not noticing that I wasn't close to the microphone. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no worries. Yeah. Wh whatever you're doing now sounds good. Uh, shout out to Black Dave. He was on the episode before you. Um, awesome. You, you touched on some really, really ill points. Uh, man, we're okay. So you were a medical admin before you started producing, correct? Um, no, I started producing before I became a medical administrative assistant. Oh, okay, okay. Did you take a break when you first began your career to like move away from production, or? Yeah, what happened was like I was moving out all over the place when I first started producing. I was living in in, in Oceanside, California, on Camp Pendleton. If anybody is a military brat, they know. That. I used to live in Oceanside. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah, see, big up yourself. So you know, you know how that place is. So when I started, school, I was there, and then I around many years after that, then I started pursuing a career in the medical field. But when I got back here, then I then I became a receptionist. Yes, <laughs> so like two thousand and eight. So I, I started producing before I became a medical receptionist. Well, it's ill. I'll say I saw that you produced two songs on a Juno nominated kids hip hop album. Speaks yeah. to the skill and quality that you have as a producer. Knock it out the park with a four E. And that's ill for a catalog record. You know, I don't know what their top selling ones are, but I know for a fact that that's got to be somewhere up on their uh, billboard or their leaderboards. Uh, you know what's kind of crazy? I love the picture that you posted of Missy Elliott in Timbaland and talk yeah. about them being your inspirations. Yeah. What are some of your earliest favorite Missy or Tim records? Oh man. You you remember when when Missy uh when Missy was in Sista? I think that was the group. When she was with um um the swing mob, I believe it was. That shit like that with the shit. She oh, did with we'll, way. You, you are pulling my hip hop historian car. No, <laughs> please, please go, please go. Oh man, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dating myself, but but if we're gonna get into the stuff later than that, then I'm gonna say like "Beat Me 911" is one of my favorites, and um, um, best friend that she did with Aaliyah, and um, like like deep album, like album cuts and shit like that. Like and and for Timbaland, you know, I think my love for him began when I when I the same time I you know started being a fangirl of Aaliyah. So, you know, all his stuff that he did for her and um, you know, when she dropped the uh freaking what's it called? Are you that somebody and stuff? And I was bugging because he's like using fucking baby sounds in, in, in this record and all this shit. So I'm like, yo, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? So shit like that I I really, you know, I like that kind of sound, like like otherworldly, futuristic kind of shit. I love that shit. No. Could not agree more. I think the records are amazing and they're not dated either. Like you can listen back to a lot of them and you said it's futuristic where it, it doesn't sound as crazy as it did 20 years ago, but it hasn't lost a lot of that emphasis. Mm -hmm. Who is beating Timbaland in a beat battle? Oh my God. Oh shit. That's a good one. Oh. You, now, now you put me right on the spot with that one. <sighs> mm. That's a good one, bro. Like, I can't even pick a good one pick to put him up against Timbaland. Maybe Pharrell. Mm, okay. Maybe. Okay. Maybe, yeah, because they, you know, they, they, they're good at using samples and original sounds and stuff like that. I know, you know, Pharrell doesn't really like to sample, but Tim does. 
So have I mean, a not 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 Kanye. Primo Kanye. Not 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 right now, Kanye. Maybe back in the day, Kanye. Kanye is the same Kanye. We can't not, discredit not, his old. I'm not I'm not discrediting catalog. him. I love me some Kanye, but but hungry Kanye, I appreciate more. <laughs> No, no, I get that. I get that. I, I'm, I, I mean, Kanye just as a whole, where it's like you look at their best Kanye's bodies a fucking work. Because, yeah, because sure. Tim, Tim has some new joints too that are crazy. It's not only his classics. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard them, and he's, he's become like he's, he's like evolved his sound, which is, which is cool, you know. You know, I, I appreciate. I asked you that just because I appreciate the, the care you have for, for production, and you are also the curator for a very, very ill page. Can you tell the world about that page? Yeah, um, that's a dope sample. It's a page um, I actually started back uh, three years ago um, at the suggestion of a friend of mine, um, you know, because I was just posting like little videos of the songs and then, you know, the actual video of, of the song of where it came from. And she's like, you know, you should make an Instagram page. So uh, I did that. And then um, I started like editing, I started researching. Um, I was using most probably, you know, um, who sampled to, to, if I didn't know what the sample was, then I would go in and reference it to who sampled and then started making all these videos um, on my phone um, and posting them on Instagram. And, you know, people started liking them. And then, you know, three years later, seven and a half thousand people on, on the page and, um, I do everything. I, I, I make the videos. Um, I run the social media accounts. I make the graphics. Um, I do everything. So I just recently moved it over to Twitter, you know, back in February and trying to, you know, engage the audience here more. But it's been a passion project of mine. And um, because I'm so passionate about production and about samples and teaching people about, you know, the origin of them and trying to hold the music that we listen to in high regard and the, and the people that made them, you know? So that's my intention. That's my aim for that page. What sample in a rap song is better than the original record that it was sampled? Ooh, that's a good one. I would say Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See is a good one. Ooh, what's, the, what, what's the actual sample? Do you remember? It's Seals and, it's Wheat Grade Fields by Seals and Croft. See, now I got some homework. Now I see I okay, okay. I love this because I think <laughs> I think that there's very there's not a lot of times when I'm speaking with someone and I know that they know way more about music history than I do. And so this is this is interesting for me. There was another piece of not necessarily hip hop or even rap or production or sample history, but just overall music history that I learned when preparing for this episode. So when Whitney Houston sang the national anthem in 91 at the Super Bowl, she's now the reason why everybody tries to hit those notes on free? Yes, it is. Because she's the first one who attempted it. So if you, if you really go back and look at it, nobody was really singing it like that before then. They were just singing it straight. But when Whitney bust down the scene with, with, the, with her rendition and hit that note on free, everybody else up to this day is trying to hit that, that same note. But it can't be replicated, yo. Only one Whitney used it. Yo, I saw the original, and it just it felt like everything's been watered down since then. It hurt. Yeah. It kind of ruined it for me. It's like, it's tough. So as a producer, how easy is it? And this, this is, let me explain this correctly. Like, how easy is it for you to listen to music? Like, can you turn off the producer side of your brain? Or are you constantly listening for all the layers and the drum patterns and paying attention to the keys? Um, when I'm just vibing out, yeah, producer ears, um, like I, I, I usually turn off my producer ears when I'm listening to like dance hall or, or reggae music. I just want to wind up myself. Um, I don't really like getting with stuff unless, you know, I'm listening to something that somebody sent me or somebody's like, oh, you know, here this new record and I might like, you know, analyze it or whatever. But yeah, I can turn off my producer ears and vibe out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Did you listen to more or less music when the pandemic started? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I think probably less of other people's outside and more of mine because I've just been creating 
the last like over the pandemic, I, I should say. I ask because you talk about in return to my heart that the pandemic had, well, you created this at the height of the pandemic. So is it the height, like an emotional height for you when it was just the craziest or the height of lockdown? At, at what point did this record come about? Um, I think that show you're probably talking about. There's a lot of them I, 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 I did over the course of the pandemic and those, that was one of them. Um, Return My Heart came about um, based on a true story. I was in a relationship uh, with this guy off and on and everything. And I think we were off at the time. And he was coming in my inbox with some, oh, let's get back together stuff. And he's like, um, but I need to tell you something kind of stuff. So I'm like, okay, well, you got to tell me. So he's like, oh, what What if I got some girl pregnant? You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, uh, okay. So He hits you with the confessions? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well. We're not together, but you want me to stick around and mind your pitney. Okay. I'm not doing that. I'm like, what the heck you how you think I am? You know what I'm saying? So um um so I was upset at the whole situation and I, I kind of wrote about it. Uh, the beat that is that it's on now wasn't the original beat. Um I actually had a friend of mine, um, he sent me a beat and it was kind of like a reggae vibe at first and it was slower. So um it wasn't working, so I decided to just to make the beat over and then sing it faster. And then I'm like, okay, I got this song. I think I need, you know, a, like a little dance hall DJ on it. So um, I reached out to my friend Collard, who's on my Show Your Song. And I'm like, yo, you know any dance hall, um, you know any women dance hall artists? Because I am you know, another woman on this, on his record. So he names off some people. I go check out their Instagrams. I follow on Swisha Sweets, you know, and I, I look at her and she's amazing, you know. So I reach out to her and say, yo, I have this track. Um, you know, listen to it and see if you like it or whatever. So I send it to her. She comes back and says, yo, this is a plot. Let me let me write a thing. So she she goes maybe in a couple hours. She comes back with a with a voice note in my in Instagram and I'm bugging because it sounds sick. So I'm like, yo, you need to go and record this shit. So record it i you know i document because i document everything <laughs> like i document every fucking thing so i'm there taping so we're about to have the orchid documentary in 10 <laughs> years on netflix not here yeah. i hear it hey <laughs> like i'm not gonna really compare myself to kanye or anything like that but that would be cool you know oh, it, doesn't, no, it don't gotta be kanye there's, there's a thousand documentaries on netflix I'm just, yeah I'm just, keep going keep going <laughs> So um, we record the the song, you know, and then um, the intention was to put it out on, on Women's Day in 2010, 20, um, just because, you know, it's International Women's Day. And I just felt empowered, you know, that I wrote this song about how I felt about my relationship. So we put it out um, and it's and it was it's just amazing, you know, what I'm saying? so I, I it was that whole thing. It felt like, I don't know, therapy to me getting that record out yeah yeah the record was a vibe i think to me like reading that and trying to think about the kind of headspace you were when you created that record the pandemic's been such a roller coaster i'm sure for everyone but i can only speak from my experience and i know that those creative bursts ebbed and flowed more than ever with the course of lockdown where it's like weeks of constantly looking out of your window <laughs> barely going outside and then there were moments, because I was actually doing a little bit of traveling, where I would be in different pockets of the world. And at times, it wouldn't feel like there was a pandemic at all. And other times, it would feel like the plague was outside. And so seeing how art has dealt with that and seeing the art that came out of that time, to me, is always, always going to be like a, the dopest peek behind the curtains, because it's like a shared high key traumatic experience that everyone uh, went through you know or is still going through what made you choose mint songs me personally i haven't yet get to gotten to explore the platform that much but i've seen a few people talking about it i've seen artists that have come on this show have used it as a platform what's been your experience there and why did you go with them uh before i, I talk about that i do want to talk about your point about the pandemic and you know, us being on lockdown. While that was happening, I was actually working. I was an essential worker. I was still working as a <laughs> an ultrasound receptionist at that point. So I was kind of doing my music, 
and trying to be an essential worker. So that was pretty traumatic. Yeah, because people were very nasty um, at the height of the pandemic. They didn't want to wear masks. You know, that, that's what actually that made me quit my job because, you know, somebody came in there and harassed me and my, my coworkers. So um, I'm thankful for that blessing because um, I got the blessing to pursue music full time. And it's been about a year and a half now. So I'm grateful for that. Mint song. Wow, wait, sorry. Just the <laughs> I, maybe I shouldn't have jumped over the pandemic piece so quickly. That was in that was in Canada where that happened. What what city? Yeah, yeah. I was in. I was. Um. Um. Yeah. I was in, living in Canada when that happened. Yeah. So I know in the states, right? People kind of know the regions that believe in masks and don't believe in masks. Where you've got Florida versus New York. And regardless of where you fall on it, it's just a very, very stark difference, especially when the pandemic numbers were surging. So in Canada, is it that stark of differences city to city or is there more kind of uh, an amalgamation no. of some places are mass, some well, places aren't? Well, I live in a province called Ontario, right? So they, they had a province-wide mask mandate um, up until, well, I think they just renewed it, but up until a month ago. So you had to wear a mask. It didn't matter where you were uh, indoor. You could w take it off outside, but yeah, it, it, you, you had to wear one. Um, I'm not sure if it was a national mandate at, at some point. I think there, there was, but they didn't play when it came to the mask shit <laughs> up here for sure. Yeah, Canada is definitely still not playing because even with the sports teams, I know New York just lifted it so their players could play. But there's a lot of baseball players that when they go to the Canadian, um, I think it's the Blue Jays, that they can't travel because of uh, the vaccine mandate. Yeah, it's the, they have us um, locked here still a little bit. It's uh, They're just kind of easing things. And I mean, people are still, you know, doing their thing. They're, they're, they're traveling and stuff. Um, and yeah, it's... I I've, I've haven't had a chance to travel yet. I haven't had a chance to travel in like four years. I, I was living in the States uh, for a little bit in 2018 in, in North Carolina. Um, but then I came back up here and you know, had to start my life over. But another story. Uh, but okay, yeah. We don't have to spend oh, yeah. too much time on that. But the fact that we were both in Oceanside. I also lived That's in North Carolina. That's pretty cool. When did, you, when, when did you live in Oceanside? So I was in Oceanside for a fall in 2012, uh, left high school, moved out to Cali, lived in Oceanside, was a beach bum for three months. That is a story for another day. Wow. But yeah. <laughs> you were there way after me. Like I left there in 2006 to go to Okinawa. <laughs> okay. And I was in San Diego for a month, like San Diego proper, then went out to Oceanside, but I digress. Where were you at in North Carolina? Uh, Hope Mills, I believe that the place is called. It's like close to Fayetteville. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're now. I was in Charlotte. Well, this is going to be a, a a rougher transition than intended. But Mint Songs. <laughs> what made you want to do Mint um, Songs NFTs? Mint Songs. I'm trying to remember how I, I I think I was you know I was intrigued by how you know supportive they were of their of their artists and and you know the ease of the the platform. You know, and um, it just seemed it seemed like you know easy to to navigate. So I think that's why I ended up like choosing it. So yeah, that was really it. And then and then I just the the team there has been amazing. Actually, you know, Nick and and White and all everybody there. So I'm sorry. Um, they've been amazing. So I, I you know I, I like I like it there at Min Song. To me, and this isn't meant to be a Zora shill, but a lot of people do Zoratopia with Latasha, but I've noticed it's not really gained much attention from the actual music NFT and like the, from that from this space as a whole. And I guess because it's not you know a music specific platform, could be a problem there. But anyway, market research, I suppose. Not that I'm there. I'm continually digressing. <laughs> There's another <laughs> really, really ill point. The fact that you are bringing your son's art into Web3. I find that there's going to be a ton of kids, the way they took over TikTok, that once the blockchain becomes a little more 
teenage and preteen friendly as far as you know dealing with hardware wallets and all of that jazz we're going to see kids start to go crazy in here there's already a couple of kids that have made careers in the first two years of being in the nft space what are you most excited about the blockchain that makes you want to make or bring your children's art and work into the space um, you're talking about kids making an impact. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard of, of William Luffy. Uh, that kid, he's 11 years old, and and you know he runs um, dogs and leashes and stuff. So, it, and he he was in a space, and he told people he learned to code at seven years old, and that shit blew my fucking mind. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, when when the blockchain becomes more kid friendly, yeah, I would I would definitely be wary because the the in them are coming. Um, I guess because, you know, there's freedom to create here to an extent why I, I was interested in bringing my son's art to the, to the blockchain. And I just felt like I'm sitting here watching him create. His mind is so complex and, and amazing. Um, you know, why not share that w- with the world? You know, I don't, he, he's, he's, he's such an amazing kid um, with a, amazing personality so and he's always trying to figure out ways to you know he's he's working on so many things like comics and um flip books and um drawings and art like you know it's amazing so i just like you know let let me just put a little bit of his art on here and see what happens um i hate shilling uh, and stuff but um i just i love that kid so much and i just wanted to share his talent with the world is the only reason why I wanted to bring it here, you know? Oh, that that is not shilling whatsoever. <laughs> I think that, oh man, okay, okay. I don't, we've been in the group chat and you said shilling and there's a name that rhymes with shill <laughs> that has not yet responded to coming on to the show. <laughs> okay, anyway, that's not shilling. Shout out to your son. <laughs> I thought the art was dope. And it was, to me, it was refreshing. I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why people promote their NFTs in the space. And not all of it is true to the form or true to their art form or true even to their art or themselves. And they're doing it for a bunch of other reasons. We don't have to mention the person whose name rhymes with a shill. But Web3 Influencers. Is there a difference between an influencer and a curator? Oh, I'm still trying to come to terms with all these fucking terms. You know what I'm saying? What the fuck is a it? What the fuck is an influencer? You know what I'm saying? I'm old, yo. I mean, no, 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 no influencer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think some a curator is a, a true curator is somebody who cares about art and and you know wants to have it all in one place and you know say hey people look at this great art you should look at uh influencers you know i i guess they're only, only about numbers and likes and stuff and you know shit like that from what i can understand and i think that's the difference i agree i definitely think there's a difference between curation and you're right. Like, what the fuck? Like, who even? I guarantee an influencer is the person that coined the term influencer, where it was right. like, yo, like, I'm moving markets with my vlogs. And I can't front it because it's, it's one of those things that, like, you love to hate, but then you do look at the numbers and you're like, okay, by definition, technically, you're not that wrong in what you're saying. But I think it's also like a scale. At what point are you? a professional versus a hobbyist where there's a lot of people that don't actually have any influence that call themselves influencers. Right. I digress. We don't need to touch on that any more than we already have. Um, Do you remember the moment that NFTs clicked and the example that kind of got you over the hump? Because you talked about getting some exposure, having some people in your circle talk about it and seeing what they were doing. Boom, having the class with uh, Zoratopia. But is there like a pinpoint moment that you know it was like, oh, okay, I get it. I think what happened with selection and sound was the moment it clicked for me. I'm like, whoa, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like when they hit everybody with that split and that whole mix thing, 
the wheels got turning in my head about what the fuck I can do in this space and the ideas I have uh, to bring to in that regard. So yeah, that's when it clicked for me. Oh, I was on mute. <laughs> so I think that that's dope. I've, I've talked about this. So I was actually on the um, the NFT Now uh, space when they announced that. Shout out to Joe and the team. I think what Selection has done for the internet culture you know, over the last decade has been insane. So it'll be interesting to see how they make this transition to Web3. When I think about one of my favorite things that I loved about the blockchain, and the reason I ask this is just thinking about kids and their art, where I don't really know where any of my early art is. There's one painting I have that's on all my Zoom meetings, and it's a finger painting I did when I was four years old. And there's pictures of it, but if that canvas got destroyed, it would be the loss of that art. And when you think about today's day and age, like my sister uses an iPad for damn near every piece of art that she creates. And so she's constantly drawing digital art. And I think that the Ethereum blockchain will be around longer than most platforms will, where it's a lot more agnostic. It doesn't have singular founders. And, you know, Instagram could go down or it could be bought out and Meta decides they want to shuttle the whole thing and all of your pictures could potentially be lost. Very unlikely, but it's very interesting thinking about kids getting to have their art live under their own brand, under their own umbrella from their first creations. And so, yeah, that was one of the things when I started thinking about blockchain, not necessarily with kids, but just art and the perceived permanence of what this could be it's very very yeah, exciting that is pretty cool um i think because um i had i had my music in like in a, a virtual art gallery um shout out to the, the v center and i i did submit my son's art for the next um exhibition and i just i just i told him about it he's very excited you know it's like people are going to see my art and are they going to buy it and i'm like i hope so because I'm trying to take you to the trampoline park, you feel me? So, <laughs> yeah, I just, I, you know, um, I'm excited about what Web3 has to offer in that work. Yeah. Yo, Orchid, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been really ill getting to get a peek behind the mind. You are such an incredible, incredible person, constantly bigging people up, constantly spreading love. I think that your music so dope. And even just the fact that when you said it earlier, I kind of had like a, a, I know there's no video, but a great smile thinking about you being able to turn off that producer mind and just enjoy the music as well. Because there's a fun, there's like a brevity to your instrumentals, to the sonics. I called them sonic opuses because I felt like I was going on a journey as I listened to the pieces that you have available. Thank you. Before That's I amazing. Oh, for sure. For sure. Thank you. Before I let everyone go, I asked them two questions. The first question is going to be, what is your seed phrase? I know in crypto and Web3, your seed phrase is normally your account recovery key. I don't think that that's a scary enough term because if you're new to the space, seed phrase doesn't sound like something you have to keep safe. Here on Money Trees, we're planting ideas, planting seeds. I like to repurpose it. On the show, your seed phrase is going to be a saying, a quote, a slogan, a lyric, a motto that you live by, that embodies your approach to your career, to your art, to your craft. Black Orchid, what is your seed phrase? Black Orchid's seed phrase is changing the world one song at a time. Oh, I, yeah, ah, I love these. I swear the seed phrase has got to be my favorite part of the show just because I feel like I have this collection of amazing pieces of wisdom that at the very least I am going to be referring to for myself. Changing the world one song at a time. You know, someone came on the show and said that musicians have a very unique job in which they soundtrack what is happening in our lives and put that in this format that gets people through amazing you know, uh, through extremely tough times and lifts them up during amazing times. Music is, I'm sure I have a hundred tweets that have said it, but music is one of my favorite things in the world. So I absolutely love that seed phrase. What song do you remember last changing your world? Good question. Um, 
I recently started listening to it again because it spoke to me a lot. But Kelly Price's Metamorphosis um, changed my life. Beautiful. That wasn't the second question, but I just wanted to know. <laughs> the second question <laughs> is, what is the price of your one-of-one one NFT going to be listed for? Oh. Uh, huh. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe one ETH. Fuck. There it is. Simple. Easy. Yo, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate our conversation. And you have given me homework. I love editing the show. But before I start my edit, I'm going to have to listen back and look up these records that you have talked about today. I believe you have immaculate taste when it comes to music. Looking forward to seeing the rest of your artist career blossom in this space. And hopefully your son soon enough as well. I appreciate you. Thank you for everybody listening out there. I really appreciate you too. Yeah, shout out to the crowd. Look, yo, see, I just, yo, some guests be coming through. Like, Money Trees is dope. The garden is cool, but it's like, yo, <laughs> they, they here for y'all. You see, a Yazara Cam Scala, Real Girl, Phoebe. Oh my God. Oh, Adia, Ronnie. Oh, what's up? Yo, what's up, everybody? Ren, Ashley, what's up, man? Yeah, thank you for for coming through and having. Man. Live yo. yo so much love i will this episode will be up later today for anybody who wasn't in the crowd i hope you enjoy the rest of your week and yeah i'll be looking forward to see what else you put out in this space yeah man peace peace peace